The Department of Air Force has been developing solutions for energy resilience. Dr. Hartman, walk me through some of these solutions and why they're important for energy resilience. Yusuf, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me here and, and, and uh, to share some of our success stories and what we're trying to do. First of all, um, energy security is national security. The emphasis for us is to ensure that we can you know, meet our mission needs first. So energy resilience is our top priority, not necessarily optimization or cost. Those are important, but it really gets down to energy resilience and ensuring that the mission can be accomplished. Can you just walk me through some of these uh, solutions that you have been developing? Yeah, there are, um, I can give you an example of two that I think are pretty exciting. One, um, let me explain to you what I believe innovation is. So I'm the chief innovation officer for the Air Force, and I look at it from a perspective of not just technology, it could be business processes or business models. Um, the example I'm gonna give you right now is called energy as a service. Uh, energy as a service, the, the Department of Air Force is doing the first government uh, energy as service project in the United States. What does that mean? Well, when you're on an installation in your energy manager, you have several contracts that you're trying to, you know, trying to work, and they all have different dates and different, you know, expectations. The idea was to bring all these contracts into one contract vehicle, but we're doing it as a prototype, and the prototyping opportunities allow us to use a contractual model that allows us to change things through the prototype process. If the prototype is successful, then that model can be used um, for basically sole source um, you know, contracting out there. So what EAS does, um, it really gives us the flexibility to uh, take care of our energy needs and also uh, includes uh, energy uh, innovations as part of it as too. So different kinds of PV, different types of storage at the installation. What are some specific projects where these installations have been successful? So innovation from our perspective is, uh, I would say it's relatively new. I mean, most of the solution sets that we hear about, if it's you know, solar PV or if it's wind, I mean, there's nothing that's extremely innovative about those these days here. The business model that I just demonstrated, or just talked to you about the ES, is a business model that's innovative. But on the technology side, one of the things that we're doing, I think that I find extremely exciting, is our geothermal projects and geothermal energy. So most people are familiar with geothermal energy from Iceland and it's called flash, you know, using steam. We're actually like drilling into the earth and finding hot rock and either using enhanced geothermal, which is basically stimulating the hot rock to generate steam, or advanced geothermal, which is actually a closed loop process that's there. So we have two projects that we're um, starting to work um, at. Uh, one is in Mountain Home Air Force Base in Idaho, and the other one is at Joint Base San Antonio, uh, which is in San Antonio, Texas. Why are we interested in that? 24-7 resilient energy at the installation, and it re removes dependence. And more importantly, if we have excess energy that's there, there might be a potential, I'm saying potential, to export that energy to the local community. So not only are reducing the carbon footprint, we're generating our own energy and potentially providing energy for the local community. So we find that very exciting. Absolutely. When it comes to those in the utility sector, mm -hmm. what are some of the financial incentives to work with, with the Air Force? On that perspective there, I, I'm glad that you asked that. So I'll go back to the energy as a service uh, example. Um, as I stated earlier, we're using a prototype. It's called other transactional authorities. It's a contractual authority that we have within the Department of Defense that allows us to test out prototypes, which could be a policy, it could be a process, it could be a technology. Um, let's say, for example, at an installation where we have the EAS, that uh, we want, instead of to power based on the, the contract, maybe one-tenth of the installation, maybe there's an opportunity to power the entire installation, but we wouldn't pay for that. What would happen is that the utility or the ESCO would pay for that, and why would they do that? Well, they would do that, and let's say the investment was like maybe, let's say a, a $40 million investment. They would own and operate that investment, and we would buy those electrons, just like we do as consumers right now. In that particular instance, maybe the annual revenue stream from that, let's say, is $7 million. So within seven years, that company 
recuperates that capital investment. Oh, by the way, did I mention that the contract is actually for 30 years? So the financial incentive there, so just to do the math, the seven, let's say, times, let's say 20, that's $140 million potential profit that you make off of that. So there would be an incentive there for a utility or an ESCO to work closely with us to meet our energy resilient needs there. And there's also an economic incentive for them as well. Well, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights. Thank you. For the latest insights and news into the energy transition, make sure to follow our socials and join the Inlet community.